Welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast, episode 50. The Bosnian fence was huge. I was having cows that were getting out. Calves would walk under because they would just barely get touched by the electricity. So learning how to build a Bosnian fence was fantastic. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers. And every episode features a grass farmer and their operation. I'm your host, Cal Hardich. On today's show, we dive into a world of rotational grazing, land management, and sustainable farming practices on a California ranch. We explore the journey of Dana Wilson and her family as they manage their 40-acre property with highland cattle, meat goats, chickens, and ducks. We include a little conversation about eating duck eggs. And for the overgrazing section, we talk about prescribed grazing. You'll definitely want to catch that. Before we get to Dana, let's do 10 seconds about my farm. I had told you last week we had some exciting news and we would be able to share today. Sadly, it looks like we're at least another week off from sharing that news about our farm. So look for it next week. I was really hoping to get to share with you today, but hopefully by next week we'll be able to. It's the first part of April. It's a little earlier than I wanted, but if you have hair sheep, you know those rams are difficult to keep in a pen. So I have lambs happening everywhere, lambings going on. I want to say I've had at least 10 lambs born today. I'll go out later and take another look. But lambing season's here. We are about a week off from calving season. So that should be starting pretty soon too. Anyway, enough about me and my farm. Let's talk to Dana. Dana, we want to welcome you to the Grazing Grass Podcast. We are excited you're here today. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. First of all, thank you for putting the podcast out there because I have learned so much. And uh, thank you for bringing me on. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Dana, can you tell us a little bit about you and your operation? Absolutely. I love to tell the story because for me, it's a dream come true. My parents, myself and my partner and our four children are all working together to run this ranch. And that to me, that's it. What else could you ask for? Yes. My parents were able to purchase the property that we're on, which is about 40 acres, last May. So May 2022. And... We are taking it kind of out of a continuous grazing situation where there was a herd of highland cattle here. And we basically inherited those cattle and thought, okay, well, what are we going to do with them? We didn't really understand what to do with the cattle and realized, though, that they are a fantastic fire abatement uh, process for us. So we left them and I had researched a whole lot about uh, rotational grazing even prior to this purchase. And so now we've got highland cattle, we've got meat goats, we've got some chicken, we've got ducks, and my whole family is just really enjoying running the whole process. Yes, you have a beautiful place. You have a, a YouTube video on your website I watched earlier. It's, it's just beautiful there. It really is. It's it's my paradise. You know, it's a bona fide silvo pasture. So we've got rolling uh, grassy knolls with oak forest kind of dotted throughout. And the highland cattle absolutely enjoy being in the forest. So do the goats. Now, you mentioned you had read about rotational grazing or adaptive grazing before purchasing the lands. So did you all purchase the land with some of this in mind? You know, we had originally searched for property for my daughter, who is 17, so that she could run her uh, horse training business. And we kind of came down the dirt road, turned the corner and went, oh, my goodness, we have to have it. And it didn't actually fit what we wanted for her, but it's working out. We, she will be running her horse training business here in the future. She's off to college now or soon to be off to college. And uh, when she returns, she'll be able to do her horse business here. And in the meantime, now I am able to practice my rotational grazing and turn out some, what I think is going to be really high quality meat product. Oh, yes. 
Oh, well, very good. That sounds really exciting for her as well as you. Yeah, she's so, looking forward to it. And I can't wait to build a, you know, kind of a legacy for her to come back to, to be able to run her business. And where are you located? So we're actually in Northern California, a little bit, about an hour and a half northeast of Sacramento. Not quite to the foothills, um, but not down in the Central Valley either. So we're about 700 foot elevation and right now it's winter time. And I mean, I understand that it's a California winter, so we're not really, <laughs> it, there's no snow, um, but we're definitely sealing, you know, the rain. It's, it's a good winter this year. I'm, I'm looking forward to what spring and summer are going to look like as far as grass, but we're, we're definitely getting through this, this winter, uh, mostly keeping everybody alive. And here's a note. Don't kid in the wintertime. Oh, yeah. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> even, even a California winter? You know, I mean, our goats are California goats. And so, therefore, when it drops down to 28, they say, hey, wait a minute. This is uh, chilly. Let's not do this. The cattle, on the other hand, have no problem with it. They've been out here for years. I think they're enjoying the, the wet and the rain. Oh, yes. So, tell us a little bit more about your environment there. Uh, what kind of weather are you experiencing in early March? In early March, right now, we're getting down to uh, a heavy low would be like a 28. That's that's pushing, you know, that's really cold for us. And then our days are a really nice day is all the way up to 60, 62. So it's pretty ideal. I mean, I realize that. <laughs> yes. Our animals, are, are they're doing well. They really are. Um, we had a goat that uh, kitted just a couple days ago. And so you know, she's a little bit cold, but she'll make it. Oh, yes, yes. And have you all been getting a lot of rain? We really have. Thank goodness. I mean, California is always in a drought, right? Oh, yes. And now we are starting to get our reservoirs back and we're starting to to see the kind of rain that we would need to see over a number of years to actually sustain a, a situation where we're not in a drought. However, one season, it's not going to bring us all the way out, especially with all of the uh, desertified land that we have. I mean, the whole Central Valley is, is it's really hurting in terms of what it can sustain, what, what sort of moisture it can actually hold. And one season of rain is not going to cover it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It takes any type of drought just takes so long to recover from. We have not experienced the type of drought you all have had out there, but we're we're starting to get our water tables back in shape. But our grasses will have still taken that hit and will take a while to recover from it. Yeah, it really does. Especially when if your pasture land is not regenerated, if it's not in good working order to begin with, you're not going to take all of the um, moisture that falls out of the sky. It's just going to run off. Right. That's an excellent point there. You know, the more ground cover you have, the more uh, grass or more water you're holding on to. And as we look at uh, your virtual tour of your ranch, you've got some slope there. We do, actually. We go from about 700 feet elevation to up to about 900 feet. And there's a couple plateaus in between, which is really nice. But yeah, there's, it's, you know, it's constantly running downhill. Um, and we do have a stream at the bottom. And so we try to stop it from running downhill into the stream <laughs> and over to the neighbor. <laughs> so, you know, that's what part of the, the urgency for the rotational grazing that we're doing with the cattle and also with the goats, we move our goats around as well, um, is to, to make that pasture hold on you know, hold on, make the living root grab that water and really hold on to it. Now, in talking about your rotational grazing, you all got to place last May. Yeah. And they had to highland cattle and they were continuously grazed at that time. Yeah. So did you go ahead and start doing some rotational grazing last year? I sure did. I kind of have a big picture thinker. And then sometimes I get stuck in the details at the same time. So it's 40 acres. And I said, okay, well, we're going to divide it into 40 pastures, which is quite a, a large task to um, take on considering. Uh, undertaking, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Now, luckily, the previous owner um, had quite a bit of material here that he was already working with. He did have some polybraid uh, wire. He had a couple of chargers, um, 
solar chargers. I don't even know what model they were, but they were here. And so I'm a big fan of use what you got. Yes. And uh, especially if it was not something you had to buy. There was a whole bunch of T-posts here. So I just started putting T-posts down and kind of did kind of a wagon wheel. I put my, put basically the idea is I put my daughter's equine facility in the middle and then I ran a wagon wheel all the way around it so that no matter where we were at, we could bring the cattle in, work them if we needed to. And the water is all right there kind of in the middle. Oh, okay. The water situation is fantastic. We've got a couple of different wells here and each one produces about 60 gallons per minute. And for those of us that didn't know what that meant that's basically a fire hose everywhere we go on property oh yes so our our water is beautiful so no matter where i go i've got plenty that is wonderful because you can get all the poly braid and fencing if you want to use reels get that all going but water's a limiting factor so often well it sure is i mean you put your animals out in a pasture and they have nothing to drink they're not going to stay there <laughs> you're, you're right. right yes so you're able to water basically in the central area? It's pretty easy for us to put kind of a, a stock tank in every pasture. Oh, yes. Um, and, just, and just pipe water directly right to it, even through a hose. So is that how you've been doing it? You, do you have a watering trough you move with each move, or do you have permanent ones set up? I have a couple permanent ones, and then if we get our cows back out into a pasture, you know, if I've taken one of our pastures and I've divided it in half and put them in the back, I can drag a water trough out to them and a hose and we're good to go. Now you mentioned some of those materials were there when you all purchased it. So were the cows used to electric fence at that point? Kind of. They were used to being um, fenced out of areas. So they had all 40 acres except the previous owner, um, he actually grew marijuana here. So cannabis, I guess, is what we're calling it these days. And so he fenced them out of those specific garden areas. So they were kind of broke, but they weren't entirely broke to being fenced in. So <laughs> that was a little bit of a learning process for them. And we had two different sized animals. We have the bull and the cows, one bull, four cows, and then we had four calves. And so the, the calves are much smaller and I can't just run one wire. Yes. Um, I've got to run at least, at least two. And the ground out here, especially during the summertime, it gets very dry. You know, we're in the summertime, we're pushing 110. So we dry out kind of like a bone. And unless you have a gigantic ground rod system set up, then your fences are not very hot. So I had to learn about positive negative fence, pos neg fence. And that's something saved saved our our pastures because I could I could control my animals better with the pos neg fence. So so you've got some negative lines ran as well as positive lines. I do now. So hot lines and a ground line. Yeah. So basically the way we set it up is your energizer, you have a, a positive line comes out and grabs onto one poly wire and your negative return line grabs onto the other. And then instead of causing the animal to complete the circuit by standing on the ground, your animal touches both of those lines and they don't want to do that again. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's independent of the moisture in the ground, which for us is, it's necessary. So is that how you're planning on doing all your fences? I think probably, yeah. Or do you have a ground rod for when it's wetter? I mean, I do I do have a ground rod in the ground. Like I said, our animals are different sizes. So mm. we, we're kind of running a cow-calf bull operation here. And so I think we're going to maintain that positive-negative. It just works really well. And I have to run a couple lines anyway. So it works great. Oh, yeah. Very good. I've never used... A fence like that, but I know, especially when you're considering sheep and goats, you come across that type of fencing more often. Definitely. And then for our goats, we use a net. Oh, yes. Which is, it's fantastic. So on your, your cattle, I've seen plenty of pictures of Highland cattle, and we've had past guests, Eli Mack, who was on one of the early episodes. He's big into 
island cattle, they have more hair. So do you find they have a little bit more trouble getting shocked? Your energizer has to be pretty hot for it to shock them? Or is that just a misnomer that I have in my mind? Typically, I'm trying to deliver a shock right to their nose. Yes. Um, which, of course, is clean and wet. But if they do side swipe it, then, yeah, I think, I mean, if, if I'm up above 7,000, 7, then, then we're okay. Um, if I come down anywhere between three and 4,000, then, then I, they're not feeling it quite as much. Yeah, in an ideal situation, they're going to explore the fence with their nose, and then they're not going to come back to it. Exactly. Although, you know, when they're grazing and they walk forward, they do sometimes hit it with kind of like their, their withers area. Yes. So, yeah, if they do have more hair, it, it definitely could provide a little bit of a barrier for them. I know with our, our sheep, you know, they just have their hair sheep, but their, their coat is just a little fuller than maybe a goat. And my fence for them has to run really hot. And it has to run really hot for a goat, too, but that's just the goat's personality. Oh, boy, is it. <laughs> yes. They're so, they're so much fun, though. I mean, I, so, I know so many people are very anti-goat because of their personality and their, their willingness to just get after whatever they're doing. But their browsing capabilities are, I mean, they're amazing. Uh, as you look at your property with all your oak forests and other things, you have so much browse available for them. They're an ideal animal for your site. They really are. And, you know, it's, it's a little interesting. People, I think, maybe don't know. Um, Highland cattle will browse quite a bit as well. Um, and they definitely, what they won't eat, they definitely will run over um, and use their horns. We have a couple different type of pasture where we have oak forest. There's big, tall, beautiful heritage looking like oak trees. And then we have this more of a bushy oak that comes through and the highland cattle will go through. They won't really necessarily browse the leaves of the oak, although the goats will, but they will walk through it, stomp it down, rub their horns all over it, and it, they clear it out pretty well as well. I wonder, and this is me not knowing the answer to this, so it's a wondering, you know, the acorns from an oak has tannins in it. I wonder if the leaves have that as well, because cattle are not a big fan of tannins. Yeah, they do a little bit. Goats love them. And we, we have to be careful with the oak, uh, with the acorns. If we have a bumper year, then we have to be very careful that the cows are not bloating and because they love them, they'll eat them. And it can cause it can cause some problems. And you mentioned earlier your wagon wheel set up. How often are you trying to move your cows through your paddocks? Oh boy, trying is the right word there, huh? <laughs> it, um, there's never a right answer. It changes for everything. Right. right. So we haven't yet experienced a full growing season. Mm -hmm. um, we're just now into March. We're starting to get green, but the weather's still cold enough where we're not, you know, exploding. Grasses aren't going gangbusters right now. When that happens, we'll be moving hopefully once a day. Um, right now, it's probably more like once every three days, once every week. It just kind of depends. As I said before, it's a kind of a conglomeration of my parents helping and mom, myself helping and our children. And so it really just depends on who's here and who can monitor that those moves. And my parents love to do it and I love for them to do it. Um, but I also want to make it easy for right. them. You know, they're supposed to be retired, yes. but they, they've moved to the country, which of course is the opposite of being <laughs> retired. And so I, if I can get the paddocks set up in advance, then they can just open a line and then the cows move through and close the line and they're, they're good to go. I understand that. And I get that because like, I want to do daily rotations, but to be honest, most of the time I don't get daily rotations done because of time constraints for me. So I try to set up paddocks on the weekend. So it's easy for me during the week. And then that, that depends upon the amount of time I have on the weekend as well. I usually have enough time, but it just takes some time to get all that going and then to make it easier for you when you're rushed or someone else doing it. 
Exactly. And so during this non-growing season, I've tried to put in some not permanent infrastructure. It's kind of semi-permanent. You know, I've got T-posts laid out in this wagon wheel so I can just run polybraid through it with the insulators. And so that setup is a lot less time consuming than running, you know, actually slamming down your T-posts and setting up your insulators and putting the polybraid on it. So we've got some semi-permanent infrastructure. And, you know, I think I think that's actually a really good point, too, is that until you know what you're really doing, don't put up permanent infrastructure. Right? It would have been terrible if I had come in the first month and spent thousands of dollars on real fences because I didn't know where the real fences needed to be. Right, right. Yes, that's a very good point. To, and Polywire gives you that, or Polybraid gives you that great opportunity to test out how you want things laid out. One property I have that's leased, that's 80 acres, I went in and ran a high tensile wire down the middle of it to divide it uh, long ways. And it makes it real easy for me to make uh, breaks or paddocks in there. And I can set up a whole bunch and then I'm just taking down fence. And I usually don't put a back fence because I've only got two watering points on there. So I need cattle to right. be able to go back to water. But um, I am strongly considering going in and changing my uh, high tensile fence. Which is not difficult. It's just one wire on some fiberglass posts. But it's still, I got to go yeah. in and do it. Had I gone in there and did a permanent fence, then I'd be like, that's not getting changed. No, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. And, and I like to think, I know a little bit and I don't, but I like to think so. Yeah. And, and even with the high tensile, there's, there is the ability to change and adapt. I mean, that's the whole point of what we're trying to do here is adapt to yes. the pasture, to the animals, to the market, to, to everything. And I think that sometimes ranchers in general get kind of this, maybe not, a, it's not that we're uneducated. It's just maybe we're not a high level of education as, as far as the, the view, right? But I, I think that it's important for us to educate the consumer about what it really takes to do it right. You know, there's, there's a lot of education and thought process and knowledge of microbes and knowledge of macroflora and macrofauna, and it all has to come together just right. There is a huge amount of knowledge there. And, it, you know, anytime I read something or gain a little bit of knowledge, I'm just reminded by how much I don't know. But when, I grew up on a farm, and of course I have some conventional knowledge behind me, but we have so many people not growing up on a farm, and, and we're multiple generations away from that. No longer are the kids able to go, well, my grandparents have a farm. So the disconnect is great there, and that requires education on, to the public to understand what's going on out here and what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I find that especially in California, you know, we have such a, a major push for higher education, which is fantastic. And um, the Silicon Valley is booming and as much as it can be right now, post pandemic. But we are definitely removed as a group here as a, you know, from the San Francisco Bay Area down to L.A. We're definitely removed from the country and what it takes to actually put food on your plate. So many people don't understand mm -hmm. how the hamburger got there or how the piece of chicken got there. They just don't know. And I think that people like you and I, I think it's very important that we open our doors and we bring the public out and we give them an opportunity to understand that, you know, yes, a, a hamburger is part of a cow and it landed on your plate, but I cared about that cow. Yes. And, and I took all of my knowledge and I made it so that the life that it lived was as happy as it could be. The environment that it lived on was as pristine as possible. And that the connection between that cow and that person's plate actually did some good. And there's, I think we get into this theory, or especially out here in California, we are told that we have to do less bad. And I'm proposing that thought process puts us into a very um, anxiety-driven state. And I would like to propose that we do more good. 
and voting with your, you know, your actual vote on politicians and whatnot, that's, you can do that. Yes. But voting with your dollar, you really can understand where your products come from, where your nutrition comes from, and you can do more good with how you're, you're purchasing that. And, and that's a great segue into, we haven't covered goats and stuff, but you are working towards some agro-tourism. Definitely. Um, obviously, you know, all of us are trying to put multiple enterprises onto our programs so that we can be very profitable and leave a legacy for our kids, right? And for the environment and for the community and for everybody. Whenever I'm making a decision here on Chantilly Ranch, I try to cover this concept of a win-win, win-win and no loser decision. So usually the animal obviously has to win, right? I have to win, so it's got to be profitable. The consumer has to win. My local environment, my actual property has to win, or wherever the animals are. And the greater community has to win. So there has to be a whole bunch of winners, and there has to be no losers. So when I open my doors and I bring agritourism here, it's one of those enterprises that allows everybody to really, really take inventory of where they're at, what they're doing, what sort of um, choices they're able to make with their dollar, and everybody gets to win. So when I bring someone out here, you know, the animals win, the environment, et cetera, et cetera, and nobody loses. And that's one of the things as we add enterprises that we are um, definitely putting into our holistic context. Very good. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about what you have planned there. But I don't want to forget your goats, and I want to talk about forages just a little bit. So let's, let's okay. go ahead and cover a little bit about your goats. We'll talk about forages, then we'll come back to agritourism, if you don't mind. Sounds good. So your goats, you've got meat, meat goats. Did you go with a certain breed, or how did you pick what you wanted? Kind of. Um, we have boars, and we have alpines. And so now we have boar alpine crosses. Oh, yes. Um, I really like boar for the carcass weight, mm -hmm. and I really like alpine for their hardiness and their ability to just get up into wherever it is that they're browsing. I mean, they will stand on their hindquarters without support, and they will eat above my head. So, you know, if you're thinking about clearing forest, if you're thinking about clearing brambles, I mean, they're, they got it. Where the boars are a little bit more focused on grazing. Yes. Yeah. And I can see that. And you're moving those with uh, netting, correct? Yeah, those guys stay in our net for two reasons. One, they don't jump out of it, which is great. But also, we need to um, protect them from predators. We have pretty, pretty solid predator pressure here. We're facing um, everything from bobcat all the way to coyote to cougar to even bear. Now, I don't know if bear will keep anybody out of anything. Um, but but definitely up until this point, we've we've got a lot of really good experience with the netting. Do you have any guardian animals with the goats as well? We do not. Um, guardian animals. Now, I have a cattle dog. Yes. And he's king over here. And so <laughs> if I bring a guardian dog, I don't know how that's going to work out. Oh, um, yes. and, and because I don't have any guardian dogs, I'm unsure of bringing on a puppy and, and spending the time that it takes to train. And so... At this moment, we're just using the netting. And that's worked fairly well for you? It's worked great. Um, I see how my dog responds to the net, and he likes he would love to put a lot of pressure on those goats and, and herd them. And he is very respectful of that net because oh, it's yeah. got him a couple times, and he doesn't want anything to do with it. So a little bit on your netting. What type of netting are you using? How long is it? Are you using mo multiple pieces to build a paddock? Yeah, we usually do. It's an electro stop, and I bought it at, can, can you believe, I have a local electric fence store. Oh, yes. It's amazing, Livewire. They're right around the corner from us, and the people there are fantastic. So I can actually go and stand in a store, talk to people, and then purchase product there. It's fantastic. So it's electro stop net, and then we have a we have a couple different chargers that we use for it. And I usually what I'll do is I'll take um, up to four strings of net, which are 164 feet long, and 
put them all together. Oh, yeah. So I can do big paddocks. I can do little paddocks. Um, our goats tend to like four of them together. Oh, yes. Very good. And you talked about earlier, you've got goats kidding. So you also mentioned winter ki- kidding. So are you thinking in the future you may change that up some? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. This is one of those things. Oh, if I had only known when. Oh, yes. Um, we, we've got a buck that we would have pulled for sure um, about seven months ago because having kids, we had November kids, we had December kids, and now we've got March 1st kids. And I didn't like any of it. Oh, yeah. I would, yeah. I would much have preferred them to be out in pasture with no concern of rain and no temperatures below 50. Um, but again, I realize we're in California, so what am I complaining about? <laughs> Yes, but but I completely understand, and I know everyone's got a a calving season or a lambing season, kidding season, for whatever their market is, whatever their environment is. Not to pick on my neighbor right now, but we're we're in that transition from winter to to spring. Um, I'm yeah. 45 days out from calving, so I am completely confident the weather will be really nice and lots of grass. Right now, the grass is just getting started. It, it's green, but it's, it's just barely getting started. We're not quite warm enough for anything. We're getting a fair amount of rain, so it's kind of wet. And um, the other night, I was home, and they were out driving a cow in that was heavy. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not doing this. It's kind of chilly. I was just happy at that point. Of course... They have a different market than I, so if they want to kev right now, that's that's their choice. But I'm glad I wasn't. Right. And, you know, I think that, that leads me to the, the concept of cascading um, decisions and, and outcomes. You've decided to calve when it's appropriate for you. And that means that right now you're sitting inside where it's nice and warm. Your cow is holding on to those babies, keeping them nice and toasty. And you've got lots of positives outcomes that came from that decision yes i think that's very important yes and and i don't want to people believe i came to that decision very quickly it took me a while with my goats too and sheep because one year as as much as i've read and as many people as i've talked to um one year i think is the year before i started the podcast i decided i was going to lamb right in middle of winter and we did that in a barn. It was way too much work, very unfavorable conditions, and that was the last time that's going to happen. Yeah, I think it's important to learn from those experiences and and to be checked in with yourself enough to say, okay, the way I'm feeling right now is not good. So let's make decisions in the future that prevents me from feeling this way. You know, if I'm worried about the kids, well, Let's fix it so that I don't have to worry about them because it's going to be a much better situation later. Right. As, as we talked about earlier, you know, we're all busy. We've all got too much on our plate or even our platter. So okay. we want to minimize things that, that are like that, that, that causes you to, to be so worried about that you can't focus on everything else. That's right. I'm sure that could have been worded better, but. That's where I was going. No, I, I like the platter wording, right? Because it, you're right. It's not just a plate. It never is. It's a platter. It's a whole, an entire community. It's an entire family. So beyond the goats, uh, you have chickens as well. Are they, are they getting to free range or are you moving them or do you have them in a, in a set pen? They're kind of just our personal chickens. There's also three ducks. Don't ask me how we got ducks. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I got them for my kids or something. But I did find out that I absolutely love duck egg. Oh, yes. Or duck eggs. Yes. Delicious. If you've never had it, please try it. It's fantastic. Well, I just had a conversation about duck eggs this week at a local farm store. A couple in there were buying chicks. And I told them they needed to buy more. And they said, oh, we have some. They're like, we can't afford, they've got a few kids. We can't afford to buy eggs, so this works. We've got eggs, and we also eat duck eggs. I said, they said, we love duck eggs. I said, well, I've had duck eggs a few times, but I can't quite convince my wife that it'd be fine. And I, their suggestion was just mix a duck egg in every once in a while. So it's very important 
that my wife does not edit this episode now. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Mix a duck egg in. It, it really is. I mean, you can, you can do some research also on nutritional content. Um, obviously, what they eat is a factor. But yes. I do think that there's some information out there that suggests that duck eggs have a lot more uh, calories and, and potential for nutrient dense. Yeah. I, I, plus, they, they just are delicious. I mean, they, they really are. And it and it happened for me. I I didn't realize that my ducks were laying eggs, and I made a an egg and ate it and went, "Whoa, wait a minute, this is different." It was a hard boiled egg, so I hadn't cracked it open yet. So when I cracked it open, I ate it, and it was absolutely delicious. So I'm sold now. I don't even know why we have chickens anymore. And so as far as where they go, um, we do have a barn. I, it, it's not really a barn. It's really just a cover. They can come in outside of the, of the weather and get in in the evenings if they want. And yeah, they're actually out in the forest. They they love to go out. Both the chickens and the ducks, they all go and eat whatever they're eating out there and bring it, bring it back and put it in the eggs. It's fantastic. I will say this, though. Our three ducks outlay our 11 laying hens. Oh, yes. Okay, as a person that's always interested in what breeds, do you know what breeds of chickens and ducks you have? The chickens are, um, there's some Orpingtons, there's Cornish Cross, I think, and then our ducks are Peking and Indian Runner Duck. Oh, okay. Very interesting. I'm not familiar with duck breeds, except I want some magpie ducks because I think they're pretty. But... Aren't they gorgeous? <laughs> They are, and they're really difficult to find eggs for. Yeah. They're, they're not just available everywhere. Um, so one of these days, I plan on getting some. It might be a good enterprise for you. There we go, yes. <laughs> and my wife would say, I already have too many, but we of won't course. mention that. <laughs> we, we always have too many. <laughs> yes. Okay, when we talk about your civil pasture and your forages there, are you planting or broadcasting any seeds you're just managing for the forages already in place and what are you looking for there yeah that was that's something that is always on my mind we have not planted anything at this moment i'm just trying to see what's coming up in the growing season in may i was able to recognize uh lots of different clovers i've got red clover crimson clover white clover uh, all kinds of clovers I've got some rye. I have some annual rye, but I also have some perennial rye. And there's a bunch of different grasses that are coming, do you know? They're they're turning green in all different seasons. So I kind of want to just leave it alone, oh, and yes. see what happens. We definitely do have some unnotables <laughs> things that we don't want. You know, I've got star thistle and milk thistle. So hopefully we can either stomp those out or graze them out with the goats. It, it remains to be seen whether any of our grazing animals will touch the thistle and at what stage in its life. I'm, I'm not sure yet, so we'll see. And always on those, your seed bank is going to provide you lots of different species. So yeah, I think it's great to kind of take a wait and see approach and see what you have and then start learning about them to manage from that viewpoint rather than immediately coming in and overseeding with right something if you've taken the tour you can kind of tell that there's really nowhere on the property where i could drill anything that that, that there, i don't have a pasture that i can actually run equipment in and so i would have to broadcast and let you know hoof and mouth put it onto the ground and i may do that but like i like the wait and see one i don't have to buy seed right right so that's great Yes. And two, if, if I can just encourage the local, whatever's here, whether it is native or improved, you know, quote unquote improved, um, if I can just let it do its thing, then that would probably be the best. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. My cows are very used to this flora. And so they, they're very comfortable eating what's out here. So why would I change anything? Right. Right. If it's working, let's just continue with it. Yeah. I mean, I understand changing the, the, the set stocking density and moving, moving them through the pasture better, but let's, I think we're going to hold off on, on seeding anything. Oh, yes. Yeah. And what's your plan with your goats and your cattle? 
in that how are you planning on marketing them? Are you planning on carrying them until you can finish them and sell them as a processed meat? Or what's, what's your overall goal with that? You know, that's an interesting question as well, because when we first arrived, here we had cows, and they're aged cows. Um, they are probably anywhere from 10 to 15 years old. Now, Highland cattle produce a, a little longer in their lifetime. They can produce it all the way up to 20, you know. So now, in my mind, you know, in, in every, maybe not every, but most um, cattle ranchers' minds, you're looking for steer, and you're looking for 20 months, you know, as a finished product. So here I had not that. Yes. And trying to figure out what to do about it. And, and do I really want to maintain these cows? And I look at things, if something presents to me as a problem, I try to take that problem and make it the, the solution. So with my older cows now, I realize I have vintage beef. So I have aged cow. And in a lot of circles, that is prime. I mean, it's just fantastic. As long as it's finished correctly, it is fantastic yes. meat. And now here we go with my win, 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 and no loser solution. My cows live a beautiful long life on this property, which is fantastic. Amazing, right? And they get to produce lots of calves for me. And at the end of their life, when they're no longer producing, then I can honor them by providing a beautiful steak, a beautiful product from a really, you know, quote unquote, happy cow, happy life in California. Yes. So really, it, it became what I thought was a problem to begin with. It has really become a beautiful solution. So we will be offering grass finished vintage beef. We will also have, um, you know, the, our steer, we will offer them as grass finished as well. So oh, yes. um, with our improved pasture here, I'm thinking that we'll be able to go ahead and finish them out somewhere in October and, and have a, a good product. And with your meat goats, what are you thinking with those? Same thing. Right now, I am trying to build my herd. And so all the does I'm keeping, all the bucklings, mm -hmm. unless they really look like a breeding prospect, they become weathers and they will be our product for the moment. Um, I've got a couple that are coming. And now being in California, we have kind of a different demographic than most of the country. We have very strong ethnic groups here that really want fresh goat meat. They don't want it to be frozen. Well, that was my next question was how's the market for goat meat there? Yeah, um, it's actually quite good. I have um, connections to the Bay Area, and there is a large market for fresh, not ever frozen goat meat. So it will be a, it won't be a, a mail delivery. I'll actually take it and um, have pickup locations. And I already, it, it'll start out as a grassroots um, marketing component. Um, I already have people who are like, wait, when are you ready? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> And with that, uh, you mentioned fresh, so you're not freezing. They don't, the, the groups that are interested in it are not wanting it frozen. They really do not yeah. want it frozen. Um, there is uh, frozen goat meat on the market, um, and it's not cheap. It's, it's um, quite a bit per pound. Oh, yes. Um, and, and it is getting sold, but there are markets near my um, Bay Area locations where they, they really are just hoping that someone can fill the fresh meat section. I know for here, our market for goat, at least here on my farm, has increased of late a little bit. Uh, it's mainly uh, people not from here that's interested in it. But yeah, I'm seeing a small change in that, which is good. Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky to be so close to the Bay Area. And you know, the culture diversity is just astounding. Oh, yes. And so I ha there, there's ethnic groups on all different fronts that are interested in something other than beef. But also, there's lots and lots of people who are very interested in beef. And many of the consumers are very focused on climate change. You know, regardless of how we all feel about it, they are very interested and what we are doing 
is productive and positive. And so they're able, you know, again, win, 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 no losers. Yes. One thing I want to bring up there, I expect that when I'm talking to someone from California, uh, sometimes whenever I'm talking to people locally in Oklahoma, I don't expect to come across that as frequently. But even on the land I lease, one property I have leased, I have leased only because of the way I manage the land. And that's, that's a change that has happened over time because years ago, that was never in the discussion how you managed it. You just put cattle out there and you let it be. But I have one property. In fact, when I approached him originally, he's like, no, I'm not interested in leasing. But then once we got to know each other and built a relationship there, and he saw how I was managing pastures, he's like, I would be interested in letting you lease it. So I see some changing viewpoints here even. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's a combination of the consumer being more educated. But that that is not really a consumer. That is a landowner, you know. Right, right. It's not a consumer. It's a landowner. Yeah. And, and if the consumer is a little more educated, then hopefully that will translate over to landowner. And then, you know, everybody is benefiting from this this thought process that we're headed down. And before we go ahead and move to your agritourism, what's your plans as you look towards the next five years? Any new species or just continuing honing your skills? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, again, am a big picture thinker. So I really do. I want my hands in the entire supply chain. It has been very difficult for us to find um, USDA certified um, harvesters, that is not something that's easy. I mean, I, I understand that's true across the country. And for me, I want to know what's happening at every single stage. And I want to be able to put my name on every stage of this process. So from from kidding in the winter, which is a no-go, to actually, the, you know, the, the harvesting, the processing, the butchering, I want to be able to control all of that. So long, long-term vision. I really would like to develop an entire chain where we can um, allow other regenerative ranchers to maybe co-op um, a slaughtering facility, maybe be part of a, you know, a hub where we can all work together. Now, personally, for this specific property, I've got a, in my mind, I have a 75% increase in herd um, year over year. That's, that's my goal. And I would like to do it without adding um, inputs to a property. So I don't want to irrigate, although we do do some of that in, in the heavy summertime, 110 degrees, there's not a lot of grasses that can withstand that. So we do do irrigation in the summertime, but I would like to limit that as much as possible. So increase our herd sizes of goat and cattle and also decrease our inputs. Sounds like great goals there and a nice big picture for you to work towards. Yeah, I, I definitely like the big picture. And pivoting back to your agritourism, what's your plans with that? So I would like to have a couple of um, very nice tents set up where people can come and stay, kind of like an Airbnb, stay in the tents, so like a farm stay. And right now I don't have that set up, but... People can come and see me. I have a workday ticket. You can come and pay $25 and I will put you to work. Oh, there you, that's excellent. How about that, right? And yes, really what that means is that, you know, I'll, I'll show you what our process is. How, we, how are we building pasture? How are we moving animals? Why are we doing it? You know, I'll just tell you everything. So that's the transparency that I would like for all of our producers, you know, all of people like us. You know, open up and let these let the consumer come in, let the people who are interested in this. And also feel like there's um it's really important to be able to share this beautiful life that we have with people who don't have it. Oh yes. You know, I'm I would say ninety-nine percent of my friends and family don't have a ranch. So if I can open up my ranch and give them and their kids an opportunity to come play with a baby goat, to come take a picture with the Highland cow, 
to, you know, watch my dog work the animals and I've got horses here. And so building that relationship will really help with long-term customers and just education of them. Absolutely. Dana, let's transition into the overgrazing section. Do you have a topic for us? I definitely do. Um, and that is prescribed grazing. And here in California, we have been plagued by wildfires. And it, oh, yes. I mean, it's, it's just it, it, people have, you know, personal, personal friends of mine have lost houses, have lost animals, you know, people have been killed, animal. It's just, it's, it's a thing that's happening in California and, and many places in the country. And so, so explain to our listeners what prescribed grazing is. So the idea here is that in the springtime, when it's raining, like it is right now, you are growing fuel load, you are growing fire fuel. And with prescribed grazing, we bring our goats or our highland cattle, whatever it is that will sit your property, and we put those animals on your property and they eat your fuel load. Um, it is a cost service, very much like if you were going to bring a, a bulldozer in and take out your fuel. Oh, yes. Um, and so our, our goats run depending on the size of the property or our highland cattle run depending on the size of the property. And that's something that I think a lot of, you know, even people who just have pet animals, if they offered their neighbors to graze their neighbor's yard, you would really see an entire community that is keeping that fuel load down. And if you don't know anybody, then you can hire grazers. I'm not the only person who does this. I mean, all across California, oh, yes. there's there's goats that are running gigantic herds that are eating everything, which is fantastic. But we do have a lot of other um, area that is very much overgrown when that's where the cattle come in. So the prescribed grazing, it's, it's something that it adds a business enterprise to our business, to Chantilly Ranch. It's good for the animals because they get out and they get lots of good um, forage and it provides a service for the landowner so that hopefully we can slow down some of these wildfires. Oh, yes, yes. So when, when we think about that prescribed dry, um, grazing, you're going out and setting up electric netting or electric fence around it? Exactly. So it depends on the animal that we're choosing. So let's take goats, for example, because people kind of wrap their brain around that a little easier. So if someone, for example, I have a, a landowner who has six acres and they can't manage it, either, either it's too steep for um, machinery or the person doesn't have machinery. So they've asked me to bring my goats and leave them there for a period of time. So we charge them per acre. We drop the goats there. We put the um, netting around and the goats do what they're supposed to do, provide some fertilizer, and then I take them back. How long do they typically stay there? You know, it's really, I hate to say it, but it depends because it depends on the amount of forage that's available, what type of forage it is, and then how big the property is. But usually my goats can take down about an acre of decent level uh, forage um, in a couple of days. It doesn't take too long. Oh, yes. Yeah. And do you, is that something you can do year round or is it just mainly during the early grazing season or later? It's actually year round. I mean, the cows and the goats will eat even brown. You know, if you've got standing stockpile, they will eat it. And more importantly, especially in the, you know, deep summer, they'll walk over it. So we provide the animal impact, which tramples the grasses, which makes them less likely to catch on fire. I'm not saying that they can't catch on fire, but it makes it less likely. You know, one little ember falls. Yeah, you're re reducing that fuel load. Exactly. So it is a year-round thing, although, you know, we kind of start trying to push it right now because things are starting to grow. And if we can keep it down, then we don't have such a monumental task come July. So when you, if someone were to contact you right now about some prescribed grazing, would that be a multiple grazing periods through the growing season? Or are they typically one and done? It's probably once per year. Usually you can bring the load down enough that you don't have to come back for until the next growing season. 
Um, so if we if we went out and grazed right now, you'd bring it down low enough so that come July it wouldn't be out of control. Now, of course, we're willing to come back, but usually it's once per year. Very interesting. I know I see. I think there's a TikTok channel, Goats on the Go, oh, yeah. maybe that I I've seen that that do it, and I've seen different people do it. It's not something I see much of around here right now, right? But I do see more of it out west. And I'm not saying it couldn't be done here. It's just I haven't seen much. Yeah, our topography kind of requires it. Um, there's a lot of elevation change. There's a lot of forest. And so you can't bring uh, machinery in at all. Um, and to hire a human to do it would just, I mean, you'd have to have so many of us that it would be preposterous. Oh, yes. And so you put a goat herd out there and they just do, you know, they're in heaven. They do a fabulous job. And now you hopefully have prevented something crazy like the Paradise Fire, the Tubbs Fire, or, you know, where people are losing their lives. Oh, yes. Yeah. I can see lots of good benefits from doing that. Definitely. So how are you getting the word out about doing that? You know, there's um, definitely a word of mouth um, environment that we have here, but also uh, all the social media outlets, um, it doesn't take but a small post you know, to let somebody know that you have it. You have to let people know that it's there, right? And then they tell a friend and they tell a friend. And, you know, a lot of times what happens is I'll come out and I'll do the initial interview and figure out what's going on with the property and what sort of netting we would need and all that. And then the neighbor is interested and their neighbor is interested. And so we just kind of bounce the goats around and the whole neighborhood gets taken care of. And you brought up a, a very good point right there about your initial consultation with the landowner. Yeah. Uh, so when someone's scheduling or talking to you about a prescribed grazing, you've got your initial consultation and you're, you're surveying the land to see how you're going to do it. Right. And then you're bringing animals out there at a later date. Yeah. So, of course, water is the big deal. Um, yes. I bring my own netting. I bring my own fencing so I know what yes. my fencing is like. But it's the water. Do I have to truck in water? Which I can do. But that's an extra expense. You know, I have to get there. So essentially, we charge for the goats, we charge $200 per acre to start with. So if you've got six acres, you're looking at 1200 bucks. And oh, if yes. I have to bring in water, then it's going to be an additional charge. Um, so it's, yes. it's a really quite reasonable, remember, we're in California. So if that pricing seems crazy, we're in California. <laughs> um, so it's, it's quite reasonable. And it just, it just depends on the actual environment that they're going to. Well, very good and very interesting. Um, like I mentioned or alluded to, I'm not very familiar with it, but I've seen some stuff about it. I'm very excited to um, bring the cattle through that process too, because for a much larger land for, um, for non-owners um, that don't live at the property, there's quite a few of them here that are, that are non-owner occupied. And so to put, you know, if you've got 50 acres, the, the goats will take a while to get through that. But we put the cows on and it won't take quite as long. So that's, that's going to be um, something that we're going to be expanding on this coming grain season, especially since we've got so much rain this year. Oh, yeah. Well, very good. Excited to see how that goes for you. Uh, anything else you want to add about prescribed grazing before we move on to the famous four? I think we're okay. Thank you. All right. Dana, I've really enjoyed our conversation, but it's about time we move on to our famous four questions. Same four questions we ask of all of our guests. Fabulous. Our first question, what is your favorite grazing grass related book or resource? Okay. So, Holistic Management by Alan Savory, you know, the godfather. Again, with the big picture thinking, that book spoke to me on so many levels and really helped me understand to define what is the whole, who, who am I managing here? Because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in the middle here where I'm the child, but I'm also the parent and I'm the business owner and I'm in charge. And in order to be a good leader, I have to understand what it is that I'm managing, whether it's the animals or the pasture or the people or the environment or all of it. And sometimes that can get a little bit overwhelming. Yes. But that book really does a great job of helping you to get through all your, you know, Read it. Fantastic. Excellent choice there. What tool could you not live without on your farm? 
no, there's a few. Uh, so we'll do this. My ATV, I, um, you know, I can carry TBOs, but I'm just a little thing. So my ATV does most of the work for me. Um, I use a really good pair of gloves. I like the Heritage brand and Audible. This is where I've learned so much and I drive to and from the property and I, you know, I've, I've got a, a bit of a commute here. So I have taken in lots of books, lots of podcasts, and I, and I use all of for that. You know, just continuing on that, I'm, I'm a big proponent of podcasts, I, obviously. Right. I don't listen to too many books, and I was actually, I purchased a, a book earlier today that I debated getting an audio book on because I was thinking, maybe I should try that. I don't know why I haven't ever done an audio book. I just haven't, so I don't know. I'm, I'm considering audio books, and maybe I should try that angle as well. I highly recommend it. Uh, if you have any sort of commute and driving that you're doing, let it be productive. Let it be a win-win. And if you're doing dishes, if you are, whatever it is that you're doing, if you can hear what's happening, if you can dedicate your ears to something. Um, I was, you know, three, three and a half, four kids and a business and all, you know, I, I don't often have time to sit down and read, but I do drive. Yes. And I love for that time to be productive. So I, I, I definitely recommend it. Yeah, I may have to add that to my toolbox because I know when I'm, I commute between sites for my job, which they're really short commutes, but uh, I listen to my podcast and I make it through. I, ha I have a weekly selection, but there's days I'm like, I don't want to listen to that podcast today or that topic or something. So um, mixing some audiobooks in it might be a good change up once in a while. Yeah, it definitely provides, you know, you've got six to eight hours in an audiobook or a podcast that's usually about an hour and yes. you can kind of get really drawn in to a book. And your information that you're receiving is a, is a much deeper level. It is. You know, holistic management is on audiobook. Yeah. And so you can really listen to the whole book. And there's so many others that, that are really, really effective for teaching you about this kind of regenerative agriculture lifestyle. Yes, very good. Our third question, what do you know now that you wish you knew last year at this time? We kind of did touch on it already. Um, the Bosnian fence was huge. Um, I was having cows that were getting out. Calves would walk oh, under yes. because they would just, you know, just barely get touched by the electricity. So learning how to build a Bosnian fence was fantastic. And, and don't get in, in the winter. <laughs> in the winter, yes. And Dana, lastly, where can others find out more about you? I'm thinking that ChantillyRanch.com is probably the best location. You can reach me by email there. You can watch videos. You can get through. I do a lot of videos on YouTube. And so if you go to YouTube and search for Chantilly Ranch, you'll find us. Wonderful, wonderful. Dana, we want to say thank you for coming on and sharing with us today. It's always exciting to hear about someone's journey wherever they are beginning, decades in, wherever. So thank you. I appreciate it very much. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers, and every episode features a grass farmer and their operation. I've enjoyed today's conversation and hope you've enjoyed it as well. If you would like to continue on the conversation, visit the Grazing Grass community at community.grazinggrass.com or go to thegrazinggrass.com and click on the community link. You can find the Grazing Grass podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, we encourage you to go over and subscribe. We will be releasing episodes over there. We also have a lot of episodes we haven't released that we're going to get over there as well. And if you find something valuable, please share it. We appreciate you sharing about our podcast and getting the word out. Are you a grass farmer? Would you be interested in sharing about your journey? If so, go to grazinggrass.com and click on Be Our Guest. There's a short form you fill out, and we'll be in touch. Until next time, keep on grazing grass. Hey there, listeners. We appreciate you tuning in and want to continue bringing you the best content we can. 
but producing a podcast takes a lot of time and effort, so we need your support. You can help us out by joining the Grazing Grass community and becoming a supporter for exclusive content and early releases. Also, you can buy our merch to show your love for the show or by using our affiliate links to purchase products or services we recommend. If you can't support us financially, please spread the word and tell others about our show. Thank you for your support, and we can't wait to bring you more great conversations from grass farmers like you.